Every person on this planet has either lied or been lied to at some point or another. Whether the intentions of the liar be good or bad, it seems that those who lie frequently become relatively skilled at it. Depending on the gratification that they receive from telling each lie, there are some that walk among us that even tend to become somewhat addicted to spreading false or misleading information, whether it be for personal gain, for protection, or even for enjoyment. There are many people out there that seem to find justification for each lie that they tell. Some even begin to lie to themselves as a way to continue this behavior and avoid responsibility for the lies that they've told in the past. Lies generally manifest as one of the following constructs. Deception. Half-truths. Exaggerations. Or pertinent omissions. Lying is a form of communication that involves two parties, the deceiver and the deceived. The deceiver has the intention of communicating false or incorrect information or impressions as if they are correct or truthful, while the deceived is unknowingly participating in some way, accepting this false information or impression due to either apathy, ignorance, bias, or overconfidence. Since human beings tend to be naturally very gullible, a skilled liar is more often than not very successful at achieving the deceit. Since there is virtually no technique or advanced form of technology that has the ability to determine whether or not a person is telling a lie, at least with reliable enough accuracy, one of the most effective ways of confronting a person in the process of lying is with overwhelming facts or evidence against them. Although there are definitely some people out there that have an advanced form of pathological lying and may never come clean regardless of the amount of quality proof you have against them, there is also some people that may be more sensitive to these techniques than others, especially if these techniques are executed with extreme professionalism. I doubt seriously any medieval man would have much difficulty in feeling a sense of overwhelming foreboding in the face of the Soviet hammer and sickle symbol. Yet most modern literate people obviously don't know a thing about what that symbol actually represents, except on the most profane level as the implements of the farmer and the worker. <laughs> you really believe that? The sickle, ladies and gentlemen, symbolizes Saturn also known as Kronos Saturn, or as the Greeks called it, Demiurgos, the operating engineer of the universe, as opposed to the creator of that universe, Satan, Lucifer. In the reign of Saturn, we see exorbitant building and modeling activities, and this is reflected in the Masonic reference to their god as the big builder or architect. And their nickname, the Builders, who erected the Tower of Babel. All this sounds reasonably attractive. Many of us can appreciate magnificent buildings and splendid projects along those lines. But as usual, ladies and gentlemen, there's much more to it than this. You see, that's the exoteric interpretation underneath is the truth. I mean, if you drive Saturns, <laughs> I mean, if you drive Mazdas, how many of you even know the origin of those names and what they stand for? This Saturnian Masonic Oedipus complex, not Oedipus, but Oedipus complex, <laughs> ultimately is building against the grain, against nature. What's wrong with that? Well, you'll stick with me and you'll see. At the beginning, in the early eras, nature's forces were manipulated with a knowledge which required the greatest intimacy with her ways, as reflected in the various megalithic structures in the British Isles, Europe, and even ancient America. There's even beauty, simplicity, and power in this early architecture, and modern enthusiasts have mistaken the knowledge and the sensitivity to natural forces intrinsic to this ancient technology as indicative of a positive force at work. But actually, with some crucial exceptions, the rise of the megaliths marked the rise of the Hermetic Academy into its dominant physical phase. 
The theory is that the megaliths pin down natural forces, helping to subdue nature's most savage furies. We marvel today at the Hoover Dam, but that symbol Latin construction is but a crude parody of the technology of the megaliths which helped to dam the wildest forces of nature. The construction of these megaliths, heralded by New Age types as marvels of ancient ingenuity and cooperation with nature, are actually the first physical evidence of the end of Eden, of that period on earth when humanity lived as the servants and friends of God's natural creation as nomads and hunter-gatherers. You see, the great error of modern enthusiasts for what they regard as the magical, Merlin-esque, harmonious time of the Druids and Stonehenge and ancient Egypt is ignorance of the fact that the historical period they idolize was itself immersed in a tampering technology and materialism, which essentially marked a revolutionary break, a break, the cutting off, the severing of man's relation with the natural order. Well, what is wrong with that, you say? Well, according to John Mitchell, he said, the first revolution of Olympus marks the first deviation from the primeval ways of men presided over by Cronus, otherwise Saturn. End quote. Saturn is Lucifer, Satan. And this revolution marks the end of man's Edenic relationship with the natural world. You never understood it before, did you? I hope you're beginning to now. Henceforward, man is alienated from nature by means of the Saturnian Sith, which symbolizes the sense of separation from God's natural creation that man experienced after the fall. You see how simple it all really is? <laughs> and it really is. That simple, ladies and gentlemen. Don't go away. I'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, man began his peregrination away from Eden through his conceit that he would become as God. Remember what happened in the Garden of Eden? God told Adam and Eve to tend the garden. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He commanded them not to. And he told them what would happen if they did. If ye do, ye will surely die. Lucifer, through his agent Satan, seduced Eve and told her, God lied to you. He's hiding your true nature. He doesn't want you to know that if you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you too will become as gods. And Eve, in turn, seduced Adam. That's the story in the book of Genesis. Now, I'm not telling any of you to believe any of this. I am teaching you the esoteric knowledge of the mysteries. And in these mystery schools and mystery religions, they believe that Lucifer was the good one and God, Jehovah, was the bad one because he was holding man enslaved in the chains, the bonds of ignorance in this Garden of Eden. Lucifer, through his agent Satan, set man free, knocked off the chains with the gift of knowledge. And through the use of this gift of knowledge, man himself will become God. That is the story. And so many people fall for this deception. For no man, I can assure you, will ever be God. Ever. No part can ever be equal to or greater than the whole. That's one of the greatest lessons you can ever learn. You think you could pick up a bushel of apples, squeeze them together and make the original tree from which they came? No. You can take the seed from the apple and plant it and grow another apple tree, but that apple tree 
will not be the original tree from which the seed sprang. Never. Not ever in a million years. Nor can all of the apple trees from all of the seeds from all of the apples that fell from that tree ever in their entirety be that same original tree. And of course, I'm making a little metaphor here, which is nothing even approaching the discrepancy between man becoming a god and God who made man. And I hope you can understand that. Man has a conceit that he would become as God. Yet, as soon as he left the divine plan for the occult process, his stated objective became the Kabbalistic tycoon olam, or, quote, repair of the world, end quote. In other words, God's creation was not perfect. Man is going to perfect it. Man is going to repair the imperfections in God's world via the intervention and imposition of human brain power, the very ego maniacal device that caused the separation from God's natural Eden in the very first place. Repair of the world. Indeed! A world the Kabbalists had only just ruined. Repair the world? Man can't even repair himself. I don't know any man that's perfect. I don't know any man that hasn't had problems. I don't know any man that's not hiding some dastardly secret he doesn't want anybody else to know. I don't know any man who hasn't done wrong to himself or others. Repair the world? Repair yourself first. And I doubt it can be done. It is not the nature of man. After the Saturnian division, Hermetic man saw himself as separate and inevitably above nature, though always quick to identify himself as nature's benign shepherd. Oh, what a deception this is. This mighty occult shepherd king figure has emerged in history under the forms of Arthur, Merlin, Pendragon, Prester John, John F. Kennedy, and many others. He is the personification of the manipulation of nature by secret technology on behalf of a secret hierarchy, which, if known at all, is always careful to present itself as the supreme friend of divine creation. Huh. If the expulsion from the Garden of Eden, that is to say the literal alteration of man's circumstance of living solely upon God's bounty and providence, was the result of satanic intervention, why has it not dawned on us that civilization is itself satanic? <laughs> oh, that's a good one to send you to bed with, isn't it? But that's exactly the question that you should be pondering. In the Hermetic Masonic tradition, the secret identity of Satan is the force represented in occult lore as emanating from the star Sirius, the so-called dog star, Canis Major. And in the secret tradition of the Freemasons, Sirius is overwhelmingly identified with a single primary attribute, the bringing of civilization to Earth. The heirs of this magical current were saluted by the Illuminist and Master Alchemist Comenius in his 1668 book entitled The Way of Light. Remember, Lucifer is the fallen angel of light. The book was dedicated to the first scientific organization in Western history, Britain's August Royal Society. In it, Cominius addressed the first formal scientists as, quote, Illuminati, end quote, and outlined their scientific purpose, quote, 
which is to secure the empire of the human mind over matter, end quote. And I've had so many people call me or write me and deny the very existence of the Illuminati. In a key Rosicrucian description of the city of Utopia, it is shown to be dominated, ladies and gentlemen, by science and mechanics and more ominously, by the medical dissection of cadavers, in other words, by the hyper-analytical obsession of rationalism with dead matter and measurement. The utopian city of the Rosicrucians is before us today. New York and Los Angeles, Babylon the Great. And it was planned in 1668, long, long before. You see, we have forgotten the depth of the roots of the modern disease. We have accepted the pop-pap that anything that predated the more obvious rapacity of modern industrial pollution was natural or magical. The notion of magic being identified with the pristine. Hence, we have denied ourselves knowledge of the beginning of the rise of the cryptocracy. John Mitchell said, quote, It is their immediate concern, having eaten of the tree of knowledge, to apply all their newly acquired arts to constructing a facsimile of the garden, a model paradise, end quote. But you see, they just don't get it. There was already an architecture prior to man's imposition of his structures and inventions. This was the architecture of the natural landscape as shaped by God. To claim that to have left it as it was would have been barbarous and backward is symptomatic of the diseased occult mind and its gigantic egotistical pathology. I have never in my life seen anything ever built or rendered by the hand of man that ever equaled the absolute breathtaking beauty of the natural scape. As long as it was left as God created, it was paradise. Everybody is looking for the Garden of Eden. Don't you understand? It's all around you. The earth is the Garden of Eden. We were cast out of it. Due to our blindness, we feverishly cooperate with the imposition upon the earth as our own version of Eden, which always ends in the creation of Babylon, hell on earth. John Mitchell said again, quote, Settlement leads to the establishment of social hierarchies to specialization, the development of arts and sciences, the building of temples and houses. For millions of years, men, essentially the same as we are now, lived without these and presumably without feeling the need for them. Tacitus described a German tribe that lived entirely without artificial shelter, the phenomenon of successive towns built around the same sacred place, the spirit of which became the foundation deity, receiving the sacrifices offered in expiation of the crime of settlement and giving the law by which the city was governed. Implicit in this law was a contract between man and God by which the first was permitted a conditional in limited use of land for agricultural and building in return for duties and observances paid to the second. So it was understood by the founding fathers of all of the ancient cities. And the rituals tell you this. But as cities expand, these limitations become more onerous and neglected with the result that in the language of apocalypse, the city becomes Babylon, the parasitic whore, and proceeds toward destruction. In this belief, the traditional element in ancient Rome 
objected to expansion beyond the original city boundaries, considering it a breach of the foundation contract. Such councils were, of course, ignored, just as they're ignored today, and in consequence, Rome, following the career of all previous empires, became Babylon indeed. Civilization you see, tends to grow more elaborate and to make ever greater demands on the earth that sustains it. There comes a time when the old natural devotion to the earth is exchanged for the desire to increase the products of the earth by artificially stimulating its fertility. This stage is marked in history by the appearance of sun gods, divinities of reason, intellect, and centralized government whose legends refer always to their victories over dragons, in effect, nature. The dragon is sometimes representative of self. The battle in the mind. When St. George was said to have slain the dragon, he overcame himself. This policy of artificially increasing the earth's fertility and multiplying the gifts of its spirit instead of accepting what is given by nature is evident in the staking of the earth in symbolism as is seen in the motif of the knight spearing the dragon which is sometimes viewed as the pinnacle of the victory of light over dark. How many times have you heard Clinton say that? There's a great battle between the forces of light over the forces of darkness. Cicero said the same thing. Hitler said the same thing. All through history, despots and Babylons have been mouthing the same thing over and over and over again. But ladies and gentlemen, we should also be aware that there is an alternate occult reading of this image. This Arthurian symbol has been celebrated by pagans and Freemasons as a sign of man's usurpation of natural creation. The staking process is seen by them as a means to pin down the heretofore flowing character of the energy of creation so as to be harnessed and bled by Stonehenge-like technology in order to give greater and greater resources to man. The Washington Monument is one such pinning down. It is the Phallus of Osiris, the generative force, capturing the creative energy for man's use. Mitchell said, quote, the appearance of the sun god signals the introduction of a technology that aims to alter the natural channels of the earth spirit and to stimulate its energies for the benefit of an increasingly large settled population. From all that has recently been discovered about the scientific knowledge and methods of the megalith builders, it appears that their system was in the magical tradition of Egypt, Babylon, and the ancient east. At Delphi, by spearing the serpent and localizing its energies, Apollo raised the productivity of the oracle. Every ancient standing stone is like the omphalos in the temple of Apollo, driven into the head of the telluric serpent current, fixing and augmenting the earth energies which had formerly fluctuated. Yet in the end, the system became onerous and ineffective, demanding at least as much from the people as it gave in return. Here is revealed the inevitable betrayal by the institutionalized system of technology of the people who have come to depend upon it. The land had become more productive, the people richer and more numerous, until, under the influence of cyclical changes in the heavens, the flow 
began to withdraw from the temples and take other paths. The latter-day priests, having neglected the principles of the old astronomical science by which the temples were first sighted and planned, and no longer sensitive to the earth's spiritual energies, could only resort to more frantic invocations, attended by ever-increasing sacrifice in attempts to repeat the former resu results, and thus followed, as it has on many occasions and in many places over the world, a reaction, a reaction against the artificial and ever more futile proceedings of the magicians and a return to simpler ways, end quote. We will continue this tomorrow night. Good night, ladies and gentlemen, and God bless each and every single one of you. Mm -hmm.